Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. It's summer. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> no. I watch TV. I take walks. Good I for eat terrible you. food. It's great. Good for you. And it's not too hot here. It's not 5,000 degrees like it usually is. So it's not yet. Good. Not yet. Huh? It's still early. We're recording no, this. as Like last week, we were recording this at the very beginning of June um, since we are actually... Both of us are going in and out vacation, of vacation. Vacation, all you ever wanted. So. Vacation, happy to get away. Va- the, remember them? The Go Go's. The Go Go's. I do. Man. It's amazing. I do. You got one for us, huh? You I got, do you have got... one for you. Now, this one is pretty interesting because all of where this happened, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. all have we have personal connections to everywhere. <laughs> no, seriously, really? yeah. That personal connections, like it, it's it happened in St. Louis, oh. but like we are close to where some of it happened. We used to be close to where some of it happened. Oh, we, so you'll listen. I'll, Anything I'll let local you know. I, I like because yeah, I, I just I just do. So yeah, yeah. Ooh, so this I is local wait. to St. Louis, all right, and the subdivisions suburbs of St. Louis. St. Louis is huge, by the way. We've yeah. gone over that before. So are you ready? I'm so ready. Let's go. Oakville, Missouri is a cozy suburb of St. Louis, and it's nestled at the most southern tip of St. Louis County, and it lies quietly between the hilly and green convergence of the Mississippi and the Merrimack Rivers. It boasts two beloved parks and a row of million-dollar homes on high, high on bluffs, which Some of them are absolutely gorgeous, right? Yes. And they're sweeping vistas of the Mississippi River and beyond. And while not all of the 36,000 residents live in mansions, most do live in comfortably upper middle class subdivisions. It is a very very nice nice suburb. Mm -hmm. It's a place where families host barbecues, walk their dogs, and await baseball season with great anticipation. Us St. Louisans love our baseball. It's one of those places that rarely makes the news unless it's to boast about its high school marching band. And you know I love a good high school marching band. Yes, you do. So in April of 1984, when an 18-year-old girl went missing the night before hosting a party at her home, people were left scratching their heads. I mean, how could this happen in Oakville? And by the way, where exactly is Oakville? Mary Catherine Toey. And I can't really find anything to say if it's Toey or Towie. So I'm going to just go with Toey. Was born in May of 1965 to Martin, who was a professor at St. Louis University, and his wife, Carol. Mary had two brothers and two sisters and was an incredibly friendly girl known to help her friends when needed. She was raised Catholic and given a Catholic education. And the sweet-faced Mary was about to finish her first year at St. Louis University. Very nice university here in St. Louis. Very fancy. Very, you got to be smart to go there. While focusing on her education, she bonded with a group of people at school through a role-playing game called Dungeons and Dragons. Now, Oakville was, and still is, one of those places where you kind of got to leave town to find anything interesting to do. There's not a lot to do there. While many people enjoy that isolation, it often drives the younger residents a little bit crazy. And it was 1984, and across the U.S., everybody loved a good house party, right? Oh, yeah. A house party offered a much-needed distraction, especially if the parents were out of town. And if you need any clarification on what a house party is, think 16 Candles or Weird Science, right? (laughs) Both of these movies came out around this time. 
You could also, if you're a little bit younger, you can think of the movie House Party that came out like in 1990. So when the Toeys decided to take a short vacation to the Lake of the Ozarks, Mary agreed to her friends that she was going to host a Friday the 13th party in her home. Now, the family had just moved from North St. Louis County into a brand new house in Oakville. So it was a new house. Mary was excited to show it off, I'm assuming. And she invited eight of her friends over. And she said, you know what? I might not be home. And if I'm not, just go on in and start the party without me. And then come in later, right? So when her friends showed up and Mary wasn't there, they did exactly what she said. Now, when you think of 16 Candles, I mean, that was like a huge party, right? Well, this wasn't a huge kegger. This was just a very low-key party. Nothing like the movies. But, you know, she had eight friends over. And her parents were, of course, at the Lake of the Ozarks. I said that, right? I said that. Several times during the evening, one of her friends would say something like, hey, wow, Mary should be here by now, don't you think? You know, they're just kind of wondering, but they'd still go about their business when what they were doing. And finally, after 1 a.m., which would be the 14th, the next day, when the party was starting to wind down and people were leaving, some of these concerned party goers called the police because Mary never came to her own party. Till wasn't there. Oh, boy. She never showed up. The St. Louis County police arrived at the home in Oakville and questioned the partygoers. And newspaper articles of the day described the group of friends as, quote, perfectly well behaved. When asked what they thought maybe happened to Mary, some of them said that they were concerned because Mary never showed up and, you know, wasn't really like her. But others weren't very concerned at all. And they just thought that she was probably out with her boyfriend, Darren, and his buddy. And then either way, the officers suggested that everyone leave the party, to which, you know, the friends agreed. But two of the people, the party goers, decided to leave notes for Mary's parents, and they were due to arrive back home that afternoon. And they just kind of, the notes explained kind of what happened. So when Mary's parents returned from their trip, they had found the two notes and noticed several things in the house were missing, and that several items that should have been with Mary weren't missing. Like, Her purse was there, along with a gas card and her eyeglasses and contact lenses were still at the house. But things like a camera equipment, jewelry, coins, a gun, and Mary's car, they were missing. And so is Mary. There's no sign of Mary whatsoever. So Mary's parents called the police and filed a missing persons report, but then later called back that afternoon to say that, you know, there was evidence suggesting that Mary had driven with some friends to Atlanta, Georgia, to help them find a job. And those friends being Darren and Ron, Darren, her supposed boyfriend. Now, aside from Darren Lee Molitor, the boyfriend, and Ronald Adcox, there were three other people that spent the day with Mary on the 12th, the day before the party. And one of them was, I believe, a friend who also played Dungeons and Dragons with them. They all played Dungeons Dungeons and Dragons together. Sorry. He said that everything seemed fine when they dropped him off at his house, but he didn't think anything was wrong, or at least he didn't feel that anything was wrong. The police has still sent a missing persons report to Atlanta, Georgia, along with the description of Mary and the car, because, like I said, the items were missing from the house and Mary was still unaccounted for. And even if there was evidence that she had left voluntarily, they just didn't know where she was and they were concerned. The following week... The FBI found the family, Mary's family's Buick, parked without a license plate in the long-term parking lot at the International Airport in Atlanta. So in the meantime, while everybody's looking for Mary, Darren Molitor and Ronald Adcock kind of show up at this hotel in Georgia, and they, they see a friend at this hotel. Everybody Everybody knows that they were looking for Mary, and they kind of mentioned to this friend that we sold some stuff from this girl named Mary. And the guy's like, man, you know what? You really need to call the FBI. They're looking for you. They want to know what happened to Mary, blah, 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 blah. So he urges them to call the FBI, which they do. And Ronald Adcox called the FBI. He's the one that called him. And, you know, they asked him some questions, and he said, you know what? We went to this party at a clubhouse near Eureka. Missouri, which is what, 20 minutes from Oakville, yeah, far, 30 off minutes 44. off Farty Far. 
Party Missouri. far. Yeah. Top party far. So we went to this party in Eureka the night of the 12th and, you know, we were having a good time. And soon this motorcycle gang showed up and then Adcock said that he and Darren decided to leave at that time. But Mary wanted to stay. And she said, quote, or he said that Mary said, quote, I'll meet you at home in a couple of hours. Right. And so the police are like, you know, where do you think you could be? Or where do you think she could be now? She never showed up. And then Adcock's kind of laughed. And added that, you know, well, Mary is maybe Mary's with a motorcycle gang member. Maybe she just, you know, left with a gang member. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So soon, you know, the FBI decided that they needed to actually talk to Ronald and Darren face to face. So they soon found them and they were at a motel in Atlanta. And the police arrested Darren Lee Molitor and Ronald Adcox for stealing Mary's car. But unfortunately, Mary wasn't with her car or with her friends. Darren and Ronald admitted to the Georgia officers that, you know what, they did steal from the Towie home and they needed to pawn the objects because they needed money for the hotel room and for food. And how bad is this? They took earrings out of Mary's purse and they were wearing it. They were wearing the pair of earrings because they didn't want the holes in their ears to close up. Oh. Mm -hmm. So while the police picked them up, they had Mary's earrings in their ears. Then they told the officers that Mary Towie was dead. I mean, they just admitted it. No lying. They asked what happened to Mary and they're like, yeah, she's dead. And they also said that they knew where Mary was. In fact, they drew the police a map of where they could find her. So the authorities in Georgia immediately contacted the St. Louis County Police, who flew to Atlanta to interview the two men and eventually brought them back to St. Louis. Now, the investigators, led by Major Thomas Munier, from, uh, he was the St. Louis County Chief of Detectives, he had the grim task of finding and recovering Mary's remains. The hand-drawn map led the authorities to Jefferson County, about 15 miles south of where Mary had lived in Oakville. And while Jefferson County is undoubtedly considered part of St. Louis, the the metropolitan area, it doesn't take long before towns like Arnold and Fenton give way to more rural settings in the south. Um, Located in what's known as the northernmost part of the Ozark Mountain Plateau, Jefferson County is hilly and it's green and there's a mixture of open pastures and densely covered woods and the occasional cluster of houses and farms. And even larger communities are in the county like Festus, they are still surrounded by farmland and woods, right? So it's basically very, in St. Louis. Yeah, very much so. It's a suburb. But it's suburb. country. It's yeah, it country. Is. Yeah, yeah. So just west of Highway 21 near Barnhart, Missouri, in the hamlet of Otto, lies a small, unassuming creek called Heads Creek. And in an isolated and overgrown area off Heads Creek Road was where they found the body of Mary Catherine Toey. She was lying face up, tied up with twine and wire, wearing a blue and white jersey with blue jeans, and her tennis shoes were lying nearby. Now, this was taken straight from court documents, so I quote, The examination of Mary's body revealed a lesion on her head, which showed, quote, a pretty severe blow to her head. The cause of death was mechanical asphyxiation with cerebral anoxia secondary to ligature strangulation. So in layman's terms, she died because the blood was cut off from her brain by something tied around her neck, and thus her brain did not get enough oxygen. Darren Lee Molitor was described as Mary Toey's boyfriend by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, but in another article, Darren's father said that they only just hung out. So I'm kind of unsure if they were dating, but they did play Dungeons and Dragons together, and that's how they all met. Now, Darren was a roving drywaller and plasterer who dropped out of Bishop DeBerg High School at 16. Now, his mom said he dropped out because he was very smart and he was bored. But the principal of the school considered him to be kind of an average student and cited Darren just dropped out for personal reasons. Now, Ronald, he was a few years older than Darren and Mary. Darren was 18. Ronald was 22. Mary was 18, too. And Ronald worked with Darren as a drywaller and plasterer and on, well, on the rare occasions that they were actually employed. Um, Neither of them went to school with Mary, but they did hang around the campus and they became friends. An interview with neighbors 
kind of garnered differing opinions on the two men. One said that they were nice guys, while others described them as being, quote, a couple of punks. But what is known for sure is that neither of them had a car, and Mary would chauffeur them around all the time. So on April 12th, Darren, Ronald, and Mary went to Mary's house to set up a stereo system for Mary's party for the 13th. And it started to grow late, and the three of them fell asleep because they had been drinking and smoking weed, right? They As had a little party. Teenagers they had a little do. Party mm-hmm. themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So early the next day, about 6 a.m., Mary got up and showered, she ate breakfast, and the men, however, they started in with the drinking and smoking the herb again, right? And this time they practiced martial arts, which I'm sorry, I always makes me laugh because I think of Boogie Nights when Mark Wahlberg's character goes, I do karate. <laughs> it's just what I think of. Darren claims that he began chasing Mary around the house in kind of a playful manner. And when she didn't play along, he got a little angry and he slapped Mary with a karate chop and that left a mark on her forehead. And what? Darren and Ronald then carried Mary to the basement where they tied her up with telephone wire and twine and then tied a sports flex bandage around her neck to, quote, mess with her mind some more, or, quote, just to possibly quiet her up some more. One of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch articles quoted Darren as saying, quote, we wanted to make her think about the day that it was, which was Friday the 13th. I don't, I don't know if it's, they're what taking it from the mean? movie, from the movie Friday the 13th, I'm thinking, to scare her a little bit. I'm not really for sure, right? Yeah, It was just a game to them, they said. They tried to tape her mouth shut, but they were unsuccessful. And then they went upstairs to drink and smoke some more. Then they left Mary downstairs, tied up with the bandage around her neck. So Mary screamed at Darren and Ronald to please let her loose. And at one point, Darren gave her a few drinks of his beer and a few drags off his cigarette. And but she was still tied up and had the bandage around her neck. When she told them that she she was cold, they unrolled a rug so she could sit on it. While Mary kept asking them to please let her go, please let her go. But Darren, they didn't do it. Darren returned upstairs, but only after he checked to make sure that the bandage wasn't too tight. So they're upstairs drinking their bush beer, smoking weed, doing whatever they're doing. And then Darren claimed that after 20 minutes, he went back down to the basement And he was surprised to find that Mary's face was purple and that she had died. And according to Darren, he hadn't intended on killing her. He'd only meant to play mind games with her. Quote, come on, I like doing that. I'm good at it, Darren said. No, you're a jerk. Mm -hmm. Come on. What do you think's going to happen? So then I guess they kind of freaked out a bit and they put Mary's body in the trunk of her parents' car and drove around for a few hours before they dumped her body near Heads Creek Road. Police said Darren and Ronald showed absolutely no remorse. They never said that they were sorry at all. They just coldly told the authorities what happened. Before leaving St. Louis, they pawned some things that they had stolen from the Toey home for gas and food. When the pair were found in Atlanta, they were out of money, and they were dirty and disheveled. And when they stood before the judge, the two pleaded not guilty to capital murder charges, even though that they had confessed of what they did. Now, the attorneys for the defense argued that there was nothing premeditated about this crime and that at the very worst, Darren and Ronald should be found guilty of manslaughter because they were going up capital. They were going up to capital murder charges, which would lead to the death penalty. In fact, they actually wanted to do the death penalty on the two. I wouldn't even and, say first they degree. Did. I wouldn't say first degree, but definitely second degree and not manslaughter. Mm-hmm. No way. Yep. They argued that killing Mary had been nothing more than a game gone wrong. In fact, the defense attorney said it was Friday the 13th. They were going to screw up her mind and keep her prisoner. It was a game. It didn't take long before Mary Toey's senseless death would become, in some folks' eyes, the perfect example of how the game Dungeons and Dragons can warp a teenager's mind. Because you got to remember, it was the mid-1980s and satanic panic was in full swing across the country. 
and Dungeons and Dragons was taking the brunt of it. Now, Darren claimed that playing Dungeons and Dragons had messed with his mind. And on his FBI confession, he signed his real name and two of his characters' names from the game. And the characters' names was Demun and get the, I, I laughed when I read this, Sammy Sagar. <laughs> okay. So, for Sammy those Hagar. that don't know. Sammy, that, Sammy yeah. Hagar's a... Yeah, little for, those that, for those that don't know, in 1984, the year that this was, um, Sammy Hagar had like this hit single called I Can't Drive 55. And he wrote the song in response to um, receiving a speeding ticket in the New York State for driving 62 miles per hour on a road that was 55 miles per hour, which was the highest permissible speed. Because he can't drive 55. So he okay. can't drive 55. He no, cannot drive I, it. I'm sorry. I had to laugh. Sammy Sagar, that's... Let's Using your imagination there, younger Darren. Younger kids. Younger kids is what He was 18. Is. He was 18, though. Come yeah, on. Yeah, but it's still like you're 18. They think that's funny, you know? Oh, I guess. Or clever. Anyway, I'm sorry. I laughed at just his name. I didn't. Yeah. So the defense counsel called several witnesses to testify on Darren's behalf, including teachers, neighbors, and his parents. And each time one of them would bring up the role-playing game, the, the prosecution would object. And each time the objection was sustained by the judge. Now, Judge Alfonso Voorhees, which the name Voorhees, that kind of made me laugh, too. The judge wouldn't allow the Dungeons and Dragons made me do it excuse. And that was very much a disappointment to the defense. Judge Voorhees also didn't allow the testimony of Dr. Thomas Radiki, who was a supposed expert on the effects of violence in media, or Pat Pulling, who was anti-cult campaigner who believed that Dungeons and Dragons had caused the suicide and mental decline of not only her son, but many other teenagers. Now, I'm sure you're saying, Jen, who's Dr. Thomas Radicki? I, I am or saying Radecki. that. Or Radecki. I'm sorry. Who's Thomas Radecki? I am saying that, Jen. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Well, Thomas Radecki is, I think I'm saying that right, um, was a founding member of the National Coalition on Television Violence. Oh, and he had go. controversial mm -hmm. views on violence in the media. He was opposed to depictions of violence in any form. Radecki was also the research director for the International Coalition Against Violent Entertainment, which published a 1988 study of films and a level of violence therein. He was also a board member of the Parents Music Resource, which was the committee that determined which albums received the mm -hmm. parental warning label with um, Tipper Gore. You Tipper know? Gore, yep. Remember yep. that? Yes, I do. Um, but I will say on an interesting note that Dr. Radecki is currently in prison. Oh, uh, for what? Yeah, as of, yeah, he was convicted of abusing his position as a doctor and oh. he committed sexual offenses. <gasps> and he was also accused of trading prescriptions of opioids in exchange for sex with female patients. What? Some of those patients were seeking help with drug addiction. Yep. Radecki achieved his success by falsely accusing others of victimizing vulnerable young people while he was doing the exact same, same thing. thing. Wow. Tell as old as time. That's See that ridiculous. happening a lot nowadays, I'm all saying. The time. I'm just saying. All the time. So, so I'm sure you're now you're wondering, hey, what is Dungeons and Dragons? And I'm going to tell you, I really didn't know until recently what Dungeons and Dragons was. I kind of had an idea, but I didn't know. I made the mistake of asking my husband, and like four hours later, I was just going to say you kind of got the gist of it, right? Two month, uh, two month class on that, kind of, yeah. So anyway, let's talk about D and D, right? Dungeons and Dragons was introduced in 1974, and it was the very first role playing game made commercially. I didn't or, know it was that old. Mm-hmm. It's a tabletop game where players work together, guiding brave warriors through dangerous quests and combat with many evildoers. Excuse this me. one does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The game is like a framework to tell a co-owned story. There's somebody called the Dungeon Master, or the Storyteller, who sets up the world, like the imagination, imaginary world right? Mm -hmm. That the game mm -hmm. is going to be set in. And he also is an NPC, which is a non-playing character. NPCs are just kind of like characters that help further the story. So say you're on a quest and you need to go to a shopkeeper 
and the shopkeeper is an NPC. So the dungeon master will take on the role that of role. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? He fills in the blanks. He fills in the blanks when the story needs to. Like he helps further the story along. And honestly, just a little thing in today's slang, calling someone an NPC is an insult. I mean, it's Wait, a lame it? insult. Because that's what the high schoolers do, and I have no idea what that means. It's NPC means non-playing character. Uh-huh. So it basically means that. you're boring, right? Oh, okay. Good. So instead of saying I was called they're that, boring, so, yeah. yeah. Instead of saying you're boring, you're called an NPC. Lamest hmm. insult ever, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> just a little side note. In March of this year in Seattle, there was an 11-year-old that called a 29-year-old man an NPC when they were in front of a Dollar Tree. Yeah. And uh, the 29-year-old got mad and stabbed the child Nuh-uh. multiple times. Yeah. Injured the kid's liver and lungs. But yeah. he lived? The he kid lived. lived. He was hospitalized, yeah. but he's okay now. God, yeah. what is wrong with people? NPC, the lamest excuse, and some kid gets stabbed. It's horrible. Anyway, back to the game. Now, the other people that are playing the game, they create their own can- characters, like, say, Sammy Sagar is your character mm-hmm. name, right? And uh, you kind of have to complete goals that are given to you by the dungeon master. You're on a quest and you roll dice and depending on what char- what your dice does, that's what your character gets to do, right? So it's it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Yeah. And one of the things that the game highlights, it's teamwork and consequences of bad decisions right if you do x y and z when you should have done a b c your character dies all right and it's not unlike mystery theater or the escape rooms in which a group of people have to work together to attain a goal many famous authors today credit their role-playing games as an introduction to narrative storytelling and i also want to say when i say it's a game it's not a board game per se and when you go buy the game you're actually buying a book and the book has oh. all the rules, and there's a lot of rules. And so really all you need to play the game is a bunch of dice, a pen and paper. You need the books, and you need your imagination. That's it. That's all you need to play. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. So the game does include fantasy characters like ogres and dragons, and there's made-up spells. There's wizardry. Many parents feared that somehow this game was driving their children to commit murder and suicide in the 80s, which is really laughable, to be quite honest. They were scared the game was leading their kids to toss away their rosaries and grab pentagrams. James Dallas Egbert III was a gifted child prodigy who enrolled in computer science program at Michigan State University, and he was also a devoted Dungeons and Dragons player. Well, he went missing in August of 1979. After leaving a suicide note, some insisted that the game warped his thinking and drove him to behave erratically. But in reality, Egbert was already a troubled youth. He was under a lot of pressure over his school performance. And in addition to drug use, he was grappling with his sexual identity. Police and a private investigator began searching for Egbert immediately. And the PI shared his theories on what he thought may have happened to him you know, with the media. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this PI left out all references to Egbert's personal problems. Mostly, he didn't do it to be hateful, but he did it to protect the family. But the PI did mention that he thought that the players of D&D sometimes believe that they are their characters and that Egbert could have been in some sort of state of mind when he left the campus But since the press was unaware of the real problems that Egbert had, they just kind of ran with what was sensational. Like the kid really believed that he would, I say kid, he was college age, but, you know, that he really believed in this Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons is what set him off to commit suicide when honestly it was just his mental health. And over the next month, Egbert tried to kill himself twice. And when he eventually did contact the private investigator. Egbert insisted that Dungeons and Dragons had not played any part in his breakdown. Egbert stated that academic and parental pressure, along with drug use, had fueled his suicide attempts. So a year later, at age 17, with his drug use worsening, James Egbert successfully completed suicide. Now, his parents never blamed Dungeons and Dragons. Instead, they attributed some of his unhappiness to, quote, unusual emotional 
and social demands that had fallen on gifted children. In 1984, the private investigator involved in Egbert's disappearance, William Deere, wrote a book called The Dungeon Master, The Disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III. He just wanted to kind of set the record straight. The book downplayed the role of the game in this James Ed- Egbert's suicide decisions, and instead it laid the blame on his deteriorating mental state. However, the story of a brilliant young man's mind being taken over by the satanic forces of a board game, it just wouldn't go away. That's more fun to believe, I guess, right? Yeah, I think so. It's more salacious. In 1982, a high school student by the name of Irving Pulling, who was also a D&D player, left his school in Hanover, Virginia, the day before finals, and he also completed suicide. Coincidentally, his suicide occurred just hours after one of the D&D players in his campaign allegedly placed a curse on him. This summer, my plans are to spend less time in the kitchen and the grocery store and more time with my family and my friends. And you know what? Thankfully, I have HelloFresh to make that happen. Almost all their recipes of HelloFresh take less than 30 minutes to make. And if I need something extra fast, I pick a meal from the quick and easy recipes on the HelloFresh menu, and those meals are ready in just 15 minutes or less. As Jen and I mentioned earlier, we have both been trying to eat better and healthier. Mm -hmm. And HelloFresh is helping us reach our goals with their delicious, calorie-smart and protein-smart lunch and dinner options. You can even swap proteins and sides to make a recipe just how you like it. My favorite part. Thank you. Me too. Mm -hmm. There are options to please your picky eaters, so you'll always find something everyone will enjoy. And you know what? After a busy day, there's nothing like going to the refrigerator, pulling out a bag of HelloFresh, and then following those super duper easy instructions. Because bam, within minutes, my family and I get to sit down for a meal that everyone devours. It's so easy. It is. And thanks to HelloFresh, my youngest is eating Brussels sprouts now. No joke. Thanks, HelloFresh. Thank you. And HelloFresh has so many recipes that we rarely eat the same meal twice. And not only that, it's kind of cool because my family thinks I'm an amazing cook. I never thought that would happen. (laughs) Oh, oh, and then cleanup. It's a breeze. It's so easy to clean up. Honestly, HelloFresh, I've said this before, HelloFresh is a lifesaver. It truly is. They really are. And you know what, Jen? We think that everyone out there is going to love HelloFresh as much as we do. So we're offering you a heck of a deal. Mm -hmm. Go to HelloFresh.com slash OTCP16 and use code OTCP16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash OTCP16 and use code OTCP16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Now, Irving's mother, Patricia, who Darren Lee Molitor wanted to call as an expert witness on his behalf, placed the blame on Irving's troubles squarely on Dungeons and Dragons, or bad. That was the name. Remember? Like bad or sad? Mother against drunk driving. Or sad. Students against drunk driving. Yeah, that was all that. Okay. I guess the ADD part was all the rage back in the 80s. And she led a media blitz against the game. She even filed a lawsuit against TSR Incorporated, which is the company that published the game. And she also filed a lawsuit against the high school that allowed the game to be played during free time. But all of her lawsuits were dismissed. Like she put a million dollar lawsuit against a school. What school has a million dollars, especially in the 80s? (laughs) Nope. Patricia Pulling failed to understand that her son had mental illness. He had trouble fitting in, and he was suffering from depression. Patricia made television appearances on Geraldo in 60 Minutes while pulling data. She She was just pulling the data out of thin air to support her claims of the worldwide satanic plot. 
the supposed curse that one of the players had placed on her son's character, it, that never happened. That was fabricated. One of the kids he played with that day couldn't remember the curse, right? Other data pulled out of thin air was literature published with names and dates of these D&D players whose suicides coincided with the full moon. And it was manipulated to seem more sensational than it was. And like some of the names on that list weren't suicides and none of the deaths were actually, none of them con- coincided with the full moon at all. Just just sheer lies, nothing but lies. What is devastatingly sad is Irving's parents either didn't see or understand their son's mental anguish, or they did see, yeah. but they were at a loss about how to help him. There's information from the polling report, which was written by Robert Stackpole. The whole thing is available online, and I have it in the show notes. And it says this about Irving's mental state. Quote, during a seminar given at the North Colorado South Wyoming Detective Association, Patricia Pulling gave a speech in which she said her son had been displaying lycanthropic tendencies like running around in the backyard barking. Right. Mm. Like that's that's the werewolf thing. Right. Isn't yeah. that what that is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Furthermore, according to the transcription of the speech, Irving pulling, quote, growled, screamed, walked on all fours and clawed the ground. Nineteen rabbits raised by the pullings were found torn to pieces. Oh. And yeah. In the last three weeks of Irving's life. And although stray dogs were never seen. This is all a quote. Cat was found disemboweled with a knife. The internal torment which led to Irving's death was plain, yet he had been normally well-adjusted, gifted young man with only a few months, only a few months before, end of quote. Earlier interviews and publications, Patricia Pulling maintained that she had been unaware of her son's mental anguish. But, I mean, from what she said in the seminar, I mean, if those were true, I think she did kind of know what was happening. She knew something was wrong. Your, something your kids, was, something was right? up. Your kids outside barking. That's, right. Yeah. Clinical lancrothopy is a rare psychiatric syndrome that involves the, a delusion the affected person can transform into, has transformed into, or is an animal. And I mean, it is, it's a genuine mental illness. I it mean, is. It's, it is. Yeah. It's almost odd to think that it is after... You know, well, you all think, these years would, of thinking it, the movies of changing into a werewolf and stuff. Yeah. Well, you think it's not believable, but if right. you're mentally ill, yeah, that happens. So in the light of these two suicides and the public panic surrounding Dungeons and Dragons, Darren Lee Molitor and Ronald Attex thought that they had their defense in the bag, except Judge Voorhees was having none of it, and he refused to allow the game even to be mentioned at trial. And the jury found Darren Lee Molitor and Ronald Adcox guilty of first-degree murder. And uh, for capital murder, the prosecution would have had to prove premeditation and deliberation, which they couldn't do. Both men were given life sentences, which was good. Mary's father, Martin Toey, said he was, quote, satisfied that the jury did a conscientious job. However, he would have preferred Molitor to have been convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life without parole for 50 years. He also said that he and his wife, quote, never wanted the death penalty, which they are morally opposed to. Darren would appeal his sentence a few years later, stating that the testimony of Dr. Radecki and Pat Pulling would have made the jury understand his, quote, state of mind at the time of the killings and that he had been desensitized to violence as a result of the role playing game. And the judge said the testimony would have been irrelevant and upheld the conviction. So we will likely never know exactly what happened between the night of Thursday, April 12th, 1984, and the early mornings of April 13th, or what the true motivation behind the murder was. But one thing we do know for sure is that the families were completely destroyed. Darren and Ronald's families were distraught. Like I said, it affects everyone, right? A St. Louis Post-Dispatch article depicts the anguish of Darren's parents, especially his mother. Darren's father did what Darren didn't do. He publicly apologized for what had happened. He clearly liked and thought a lot of Mary. And, of course, the Toey family was forever changed. They were, I mean, you have to be. Losing their youngest child would have to, would destroy me. That's all I'm saying. Now, the publisher of Dungeons and Dragons made changes in 1989. They removed references to demons and devils in the second printing of the manual. Later, Wizards of the Coast would buy the game and they would relax those restrictions. But never fear, 
relations and re- interactions with the creatures, like devils and demons, are you know considered evil now, where before they weren't just considered part of the game. Now, since hmm. the panic of the 80s, many licensed professionals have conducted many studies to see if there is a casual link between role-playing games and suicide or criminal behavior. And in 2015, there was a study published in Psychiatric Quarterly, and they suggested that psychiatrists do not associate role-playing games such as Dungeons & Dragons with poor mental health. In 2012, in the Journal of Religion and Pop Culture, their study found that, quote, suicide amongst RPG role-playing games, gamers, was actually significantly lower than the national average for the age demographic of 15 to 25-year-olds, which I actually think that was kind of interesting. I think that makes sense, though, because you find you're, if you're like a kid that's on the outer fray, right, mm-hmm. and you find these people to be friends with, I th- I would agree with that. Right. I think you found your people. Right. Your, your tribe. Right. Yeah. And so if you watch TV like us in season four of the beloved Netflix series Stranger Things, when all the odd things, you know, the weird things in the town of Hawkins mm-hmm. start going on, it was all blamed on a group of Dungeons and Dragons players. Right. And it was led by my favorite long haired guitar wielding troublemaker <laughs> character by the name of Eddie Munson. The Duffer brothers, who are the showrunners, are acknowledging that the mindset of the panic in the 1980s, pretty much. And yeah. the COVID-19 pandemic fueled a full on resurgence of the game when the lockdown forced people to find ways to engage with friends online. And because of the popularity of Stranger Things. Thank you very much. The Duffer brothers haven't just acknowledged a witch hunt from our past. They've highlighted that sometimes our youth is misunderstood. And without life skills and experience to verbalize that they're struggling, whether it be a giant Demi Gorgon from the upside down or a failed math test to poverty, abandonment issues, mental illness, sexual identity. I mean, the teenagers often protect their fears and their anxiety and disappointment in ways unfathomable to the adults around them. Now, to find a boogeyman to blame for the delinquent behavior of teenagers is a failure to recognize, in essence, willful ignorance of the real issue plag- plaguing those individuals or the teenagers, really. So, Camille, you may be wondering, hey, where's Darren Molitor and uh, Ronald Adcox today? I was right? actually just thinking that. You were? Well, it I seems was. that Darren, he was released on parole in 2022. We Nuh-uh. called him to find out. Mm-hmm. He served his time in prison. He served 35 plus years. Ronald Adcox, he's still behind bars. And at first we were like, why did Darren free and why is Ronald still in prison? And we had a hard time finding him, right? Finally, I found an article that had Ronald's middle name in it. And I plugged that in with the state of Missouri and bam, (laughs) found it. It seems that... Ronald Adcox, um, when he was sent to federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, Mm -hmm. he and another inmate murdered a man by the name of Louis uh, Marino on July 16th in 1991. Adcox strangled the victim with a cord while the other man held the victim's legs down. Oh, geez. Um, And (laughs) why people do this, I have no idea, but... Adcox represented himself in court, and believe it or not, that never really works out. Um, He was found guilty of murder and conspiracy to commit murder, and he was given a sentence of two concurrent life terms Mm. for that murder. Oh, Mm. but wait, it doesn't stop there. There's more. I found an article on the KMOV Channel 4 website from January of 2022. In 1993, an informant went to a St. Louis homicide detective by the name of Chris Pappas. He works cold cases and he'd been assigned cold cases. And this informant said he had some information on the 1980 murders of Gary Consolino, who was a 20-year-old junior at UM University of Missouri, St. Louis, and Ellen Dooling, who was an 18-year-old freshman at SLU. Awesome. Well, this one is like one of the, one of the oldest cold cases in St. Louis. Yeah. What happened is Gary and Ellen had met at the mall, the Crestwood Plaza. You know, they both worked there and they got along. R.I.P. After- Crestwood Plaza. Yep. It's gone now. And after about a month or so, they decided to go out on a date. 
So the two had gone out, out of their first date, and about four in the morning, Ellen's dad heard something in the driveway. He heard a noise. It turned out that it was there was a car in the driveway, and it was running. The car was the engine was on, right? So when he went to check it out, he found Ellen and Gary both dead in the car. They had been shot, and I mean that nothing was stolen. There wasn't any signs of a struggle. You know, it was just senseless, a senseless crime. I mean, there's no motive for their deaths like anybody can see, right? Well, this informant claimed that while he was in prison, he spoke with another inmate by the name of Ronald Adcox. And uh, Adcox claimed that he was, quote, higher than a kite and killed the couple after a late night road rage incident. And this was four years before Mary Toey. Ronald would have been 18 when this happened. And sure enough, when Pappas checked this out, Adcox lived between Gary and Ellen in 1980, in the November of 1980, and also hung out at Francis Park. They were in Holly Hills, right? Oh, yeah. Remember, we used to live by Yes, Holly I Hills. do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The detective decided to visit Adcox in prison, and when he walked in, Adcox said, quote, I've been waiting for you to come. And then when Pappas asked about the murders of Gary uh, and Ellen, Adcox said, quote, I wouldn't have done it if I was sober, but if I was drunk and high, I might have. Oh. And also he said, I'm going to make you prove it. And before Pappas left Adcox, the last words were, if I knew I would be here in prison for the rest of my life, I would fess up. And the thing is, he's going to be in prison for the rest of his yes, life. Yes, he is. So why he doesn't admit to the murders of Gary Casolino and Ellen Dooling is beyond me. So if you're listening, Ronald, damn it. They, ne- they never want to give that up, though. They don't. Give the parents closure. So which makes me think, OK, at first when I was doing this, you know, reading all the articles and everything, I'm like, well, gosh, maybe it was an accident. They were drunk. They were stoned. Maybe so. they lost track of time. Maybe they tied the bandage too tight because, you know, you're not in your right senses with all that happening. Things happen, right? Maybe it was an accidental death. Uh, uh-huh. But then all this stuff about Ronald later? I don't know. Like, Oh, I think you know. I think you know. I know. I know but that still. you think that you don't want to know because it's easier to pretend like I don't know. But I think you know. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I know. You know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But anyway, that's the uh, Dungeons and Dragons case in St. Louis. And how it relates to us is everything around us that happened in the 90s. Like um, Ronald Adcox lived two blocks away from my old apartment in the city. Darren lived on the hill in St. Louis. Mary Oakville is very close to us. Where Mary was found is very close to us. Yeah, like we're everything. Like when Loretta was... (laughs) researching all this for me she texted me and she goes oh my god the house that mary lived in backs up to my daughter's house like it's just it's uh, a yeah it is crazy. like it's the one case that we can do and say i know exactly where that was you know yeah and then the murder and then the murder of gary consolino and ellen dooling that was just blocks away from where you lived in the 90s and the Francis Park, where Francis Park, Ronald, it. where mm. Ronald hung out. All the time. I would go there yep. all the time. I would walk the dog right. there. The dog would play in the fountain. I would go. There. And I think about this on my um, 20 years old, 21 mm-hmm. years old. I'd go running down there 10 30, 11 o'clock at night by myself. That's yeah. crazy. That's yeah. Crazy. I'd walk the dog there around that. Yep. I mean, just it's, it's safe and or back you know, in the time. Everybody, it's safe. It's always, it's, you've always think it's safe, safe there. but yeah. I know, but it was just uh, the first case that I've covered that is like that, that I actually knew were not really even have to look things up, right? Like he lived on, Ronald lived on Macklin, right? Yeah. I would drive it past it every day on the way to the book wholesaler that I worked at. So crazy. Yeah, just interesting. Wow. Interesting. And the whole Dungeons yeah. and Dragons thing. Yeah. I mean, who knew? And yeah, but I, I just, think that people use that as an excuse, too, because I don't think you could be like you could play somebody else in your other life, you know, yeah. actors, actresses. We all do that or being, you know, on your best behavior on a date or something. But that doesn't mean that you that's a license to go kill somebody. I know. And I think it all boils down to like the moral panic, like every oh, my God, it's Satan. It's good versus evil. 
Oh, and another thing, thanks to Stranger Things, the season four, the Google searches for how to play Dungeons and Dragons shot up by like 600%. From and the Stranger search Things? For, uh-huh. And the search mm-hmm. for Dungeons and Dragons starter set went up by 250%. I, so people like, got interested in it again from doing it, which is kind of it's, fun. It's kind of cool. Too much work for me. You know what I mean? Like, that's a lot. I think once you got out. in to the game, once you learned it, yeah, it would be fun it. because it's your be- total imagination and there's no ru- well there's rules there are a lot of rules but like whatever your imagination can come yeah. up with that's what will happen right so i don't know it's good it's fun anyway that's it that's all i've got all right that was kind of a long episode so i guess we won't really didn't mean to but banter that much you know because so. whatever but anyway we'll see you so when it in other news Remember, <laughs> lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.